Okay, move out. and awesome body of water that lies between America and Asia borders a wide variety of lands where live a billion people ranging from space age sophisticates to the stone age aborigines of Australia. This great sea stirred by epic currents and by the legendary trade winds inhabited by creatures as countless as the sands. Devastating in the anger of its typhoons and tidal waves is known by the gentle name Pacific. With its more than 400 installations throughout the widely scattered shores of this ocean, west to Asia and down to the South Pole, the United States Army Pacific User Pack is deployed over 40% of the Earth's surface. User Pack the largest overseas army command in the free world has ranged up to a strength of one half million soldiers and 90,000 civilians. The command has its headquarters in the beautiful island state of Hawaii. Near Honolulu, Fort Shafter, for more than 60 years an army post, is today the headquarters for the United States Army Pacific. Although war seems remote here among the orderly rows of venerable palms, this is in fact the fountainhead of the activity of many thousands of troops deployed over 12 million square miles of Pacific land. Here, concepts and plans are originated and set in motion. Distance is the constant enemy. Vast quantities of supplies are needed to support our troops. The 8,000 miles from San Francisco to Saigon takes 20 days by ship and 20 to 40 hours by aircraft. The vital necessity of maintaining close contact with units so dispersed has been met by developing a remarkable network of communication facilities. Powerful transmitters and strangely shaped antennas transmit and receive a heavy flow of messages required by the Army's massive operations. To carry out its mission, User Pack has set up seven subordinate commands. U.S. Army, Hawaii. Japan. Ryukyu Islands. Taiwan. 8th U.S. Army, Korea. U.S. Army Support Command, Thailand. And Vietnam. The headquarters for U.S. Army Hawaii, Yusur Ha, is in famous Schofield Barracks. It directs the Army's installations throughout the state. Yusur Ha is prepared to receive, station, and deploy an entire division. Hawaii-based troops are made combat ready for action in any area of the Pacific by intensive training programs. The sounds of battle rebound from mountains born of volcanoes. The Hawaiian Command also works with National Guard units to provide air defense for the islands. They man the Nike Hercules sites located strategically on the principal islands. The National Guard holds annual maneuvers on the big island of Hawaii, gaining skill with the weapons they would use against any potential enemy. The Army maintains a close relationship with Civil Defense Headquarters located in the crater of Diamond Head.
an elaborate underground labyrinth stands ready for use in case of enemy attack or natural disaster. Also in user hall command is Tripler Army Medical Center. With 1,000 beds, it is the most modern armed forces hospital in the Pacific. Its patients come from all over the Pacific Command and from all the services. As the first major land base west of the mainland, Hawaii is an important Army shipping center. Across its docks pass the supplies and hardware of war. Nearly 4,000 miles away, a U.S. Army command is found in Japan. This great industrial nation, advantageously located in the Western Pacific, makes a logical procurement center for certain items. Here in this quality testing lab operated by U.S. Army Japan, items are checked to make certain they meet standards. Many items the Army buys are sent to this lab for study. Not only are some new things purchased in Japan, old equipment is restored. At an inventory control point outside Tokyo, unserviceable or damaged equipment from Korea, Vietnam and other Pacific countries is rejuvenated. Whenever further use is possible, combat vehicles are rebuilt and tested for return to use. Millions of dollars worth of supplies and restored equipment is shipped every year to countries allied with us in the military assistance program to strengthen them against the communist threat. U.S. Army Transportation Command is a key factor in these operations, handling both new and old, inbound and outbound, in a gigantic, endless flow of materiel and supplies. Basic necessities, such as petroleum, are stockpiled for quick response when needed. The Armed Forces Far East Network broadcast the familiar sounds of home-style programming for all Americans in the area. The Armed Forces newspaper, Pacific Stars and Stripes, a lively tabloid-sized publication, is turned out daily in offices located in Tokyo. Up to the minute, world news is rushed by air to men all over the Pacific. Stars and Stripes prides itself on its fast delivery to men in the forefront of the Far East defenses. Of great importance to the fighting men are the fine hospital facilities established in Japan within practical range of the war zone. With fast air transportation a routine matter, patients given emergency treatment in Vietnam can be evacuated in a few hours to Japan. There, intensive surgical and medical care is readily available. In addition to fine surgical facilities, much care and attention is given to physical therapy, the retraining and strengthening of muscles of seriously injured men. The reward comes when patients are able to make it on their own. Many men, after a period of rest and recuperation, are able to return to active duty with their outfits. Those requiring long recovery periods are often sent via helicopter to a large air base where they are flown back to the States. Besides care of patients, the Army doctors carry on a quiet war fought in test tubes against such insidious tropical diseases as schistosomiasis. Here, hundreds of infected snails carrying the deadly disease are carefully tended to keep a constant source of research material for the progressive battle. A short distance from Japan is Korea. Since 1950, it has been home to the 8th U.S. Army. 
For the first three years, it fought a war here. In July of 1953, a truce was signed with the communists so that a peace treaty could be worked out. That was a long time ago, and the enemy is still unwilling to negotiate. So, all these many years later, replacements are still coming in at the rate of almost 50,000 a year. In this land full of old memories, Punch Bowl, Heartbreak Ridge, Porkchop Hill, Old Baldy, in which victory was won back from apparent defeat, we are still facing an armed enemy there in North Korea. Two U.S. infantry divisions stand ready to back up the South Koreans. Close to the DMZ, astride a traditional invasion route to Seoul, is our second infantry division, geared for instant action. Patrols of the 2nd are daily searching the countryside for any sign of infiltrators. These patrols are in deadly earnest because infiltration is a reality and these men never know at what instant they may be brought under fire by an enemy ambush. The other U.S. division on duty, the 7th, stands by on call to move its forces wherever needed. Exacting training and discipline keep the men at the peak of readiness. Members of the South Korean Army, who volunteer to serve within U.S. Army units, join in the training. Quick response and self-reliance are objects of this training, which includes improvised river crossings of the kind that would be used in combat conditions. A faster expedient, the slide for life. Practical experience is gained in crossing Korea's well-known rugged mountains. It's faster coming down. In modern war, planes are swift and warning is short. Seconds determine survival. Members of anti-aircraft missile crews rehearse the assignments they would perform in an actual attack. These clockwork rehearsals shave missile delivery time. The mighty missiles are ready to reach for the sky. At all times, eyes search the DMZ and nearby terrain for any sign of enemy activity. Many bunkers stand by that would be quickly manned in time of combat. Meanwhile, news of the rest of the world comes to our troops in Korea by newspaper and broadcasts, which bring up to the minute news flashes delivered to the military audience by one of its own members. AFKN Radio reaches an even larger audience more hours of the day and night. These American programs are also winning a new audience. But always there is a treacherous enemy to be watched for, waited for, through many a long hour, day and night, in a vigil that cannot be relaxed for an instant. Our soldiers scan the terrain at the DMZ to ensure that the hard-won stability in this part of the world is maintained. The growing standard of living continues to grow, and the Korean people continue to enjoy the fruits of their freedom. A few hours away by air is another important ally in the defense of the Pacific, Taiwan, with its principal city of Taipei. Although we have relatively few military personnel in the Republic of China, an important liaison is maintained by the Military Assistance Advisory Group. Planning for the defense of Taiwan is an important part of the job. The Republic of China's army is highly trained and works with determination to reach its greatest potential. 
academically as well as militarily. This well-organized force is a major deterrent to Red China. The Red leaders cannot make any move without considering the reaction of forces on Taiwan. Coordination of training concepts is important when troops of various nations may have to work together. The mutual understanding of each other's methods today may well save lives tomorrow. For in the extraordinarily complicated operations of modern warfare, far greater knowledge and experience is needed than at any other time in history. In the Republic of China, the U.S. Army operates essential world communications for all the United States services. This switchboard can reach out across the world through the strategically placed network of U.S. stations. USERPAC's most western command is the U.S. Army Support Command, Thailand. For many years, Thailand has been a nation undisturbed by wars and revolutions that have troubled its neighbors. But a shadow falls over the peace of this lovely land today. Communist leaders have made no secret that Thailand is a target for an attempted takeover. The busy streets of the city show no evidence of this threat. But the Thais are girding to defend themselves. And these crowded streets do not lend themselves to the heavy traffic of military preparations with vast shipments of ammunition and supplies. Bangkok's harbor, already filled to capacity with the normal commerce of the country, would bottleneck military shipping. So our army engineers helped to construct an entirely new port complex at Sadaheep in open country, far away from the congestion of the city. Docking facilities began with a DeLong floating pier. Permanent deep water berths were constructed under contract, making Sadaheep another main port of entry for Thailand. In addition, large capacity fuel lines were constructed, extending to anchored ships out over the water so that fuel pumped directly from the ships can travel by pipe to tank farms nearby. At the same time, U.S. Army engineers are building a road to run inland from Sadaheep, bypassing Bangkok altogether. The road provides a direct route northward from the seaport, passing through areas in the heart of the country where no roads existed. Thailand has a problem in the physical isolation of substantial numbers of its people from their own government. Bulldozers are cutting through that isolation. New world machinery cuts away the ancient hillside. As this road vital to defense against communist subversion advances, it also opens the way to a richer life for thousands who live in the countryside. Further north, rough and difficult terrain is forced to yield to this modern highway, which will supply the needs of the military and make rapid cross-country movement possible. Men and materiel for the big job come from an engineer complex near Korat. Camp friendship at Korat reflects the size and importance of the task. American units in outlying parts look to camp friendship for support and supply. It is coordinated by headquarters, U.S. Army Support Command, Thailand. As in most key areas of the Pacific, the Army maintains modern, sophisticated communications. Although most of Thailand has a strong sense of independence and loyalty to the country and is firmly anti-communist, increasing numbers of Thai special forces are undergoing intensive training to counter small groups of communists infiltrating the remote borders. The Thais train to stop these insurgents gaining control over isolated areas of Thailand. 
The Thai Special Forces learn techniques of counterinsurgency, both in classrooms where the meaning and theory are clearly established, and in the field where practical operations are taught by doing. As co-members of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, U.S. and Thai troops have jointly participated in exercises to sharpen defense against aggression. In operations like this, new and advanced techniques are learned by all the Allies, with each contributing from its experience. All military activities, including this exercise, require massive logistical support. And it is in support that the integrated structure of user pack comes into sharp focus. Although routine supplies for the war in Vietnam go directly from the United States to Vietnam, critical supply requirements are met from the Army's forward base at Okinawa. This base also provides full supply support to the Army activities in Thailand and backup maintenance support for all Army forces in Southeast Asia. The important strategic location of this forward base of operations has given it the title Keystone of the Pacific. One of the major commands on Okinawa is the 2nd Logistical Command. The request from Vietnam for the urgently needed materiel required by Army units fighting a war feed in here. Swiftly, the requests are handled with the aid of modern electronic equipment. Some of the requests for critical supplies must be referred back to the U.S. The giant stockpile of materiel maintained here by the second log command fills many of the requests. But vast though it is, the job of answering the urgent needs of war in Vietnam is only part of the story in Okinawa. The mission here is even broader, to be able to meet the projected and emergency needs of Army forces throughout the Pacific area. In a command where the constant enemy is distance, a concept of forward strategy is essential. Okinawa's contribution is manifest in the warehouses, shops and storage areas with which the island bristles. All this vital activity is served by another link in the Army communications system. Tactical forces on the island, as well as its logistical mission, advance Okinawa's role in user PAC's forward strategy. Special forces train here to meet the challenge of unconventional warfare. Recent history in the Pacific has proven clearly enough the need for a guerrilla fighting capability in our army. These troops train in the special skills which give the army that capability. Psychological warfare, the battle for men's minds, is waged in many ways. Radio programs are beamed behind enemy lines to reach the people themselves with news and information they would otherwise be denied. To reinforce the message and to reach others who do not have radios, Psychological Warfare Operations prepares millions of leaflets each month for airdrop. These often comment on current events and show the lies of false enemy propaganda. Some leaflets encourage Viet Cong to desert and use the leaflet as a safe conduct pass. The effectiveness is clearly shown in the fact that thousands of Viet Cong use the safe conduct pass each month to come over to our side. These men will not be firing weapons at our soldiers. The paper war pays off. In all of User Pack's vast operations, the area on which the world's attention is primarily focused is Vietnam. It was this land that the communists chose as the test case and springboard to the conquest of Southeast Asia. Faced with the rapid growth of a hot war, the manner in which the entire U.S. Army was restructured, trained, automated, deployed under restrictive peacetime rules, and fought, will be recognized in future years as one of its greatest accomplishments. 
As the fighting grew heavier, the Army had to expand its physical facilities with millions of dollars worth of construction of roads, ports, depots, airfields, barracks, and operations facilities. They had to find faster ways to cross jungles. Today's dimension of battlefield mobility would scarcely have been credible a decade ago. This may well come to be known as the helicopter war. With the enemy's escalation of the war, the U.S. countered with a response which stemmed the tide and steadily began turning it. The great buildup to turn that tide of war involves problems of logistic support as great as the problem of combat manpower. Each month, more than one half million short tons of supplies are brought into Vietnam and distributed through the major army ports in Saigon, Newport, Cameron Bay, and Quinh Nhon. A strategic communications command unit under the army operates communications for all services and government agencies in Vietnam. Today, in four major war zones, over a hundred maneuver battalions, infantry, armor, artillery, and cavalry are seeking out and destroying Viet Cong and North Vietnamese main forces and bases. We are blowing up their decades-old tunnel systems. The South Vietnamese, encouraged by American achievements, cooperate increasingly in rooting out the enemy. More and more enemy weapons supplies and documents are being captured. Together with our allies, the U.S. objective in Vietnam today remains what it has been from the beginning, to help the Vietnamese people achieve peace and stability, and to persuade the aggressors, both the Viet Cong insurgents and the regular troops of North Vietnam, both controlled by the government of Hanoi, that their aggression will not pay. By USERPAC's forward deployments throughout the Pacific of units trained and ready for combat, backed up by a ring of logistics bases, the communist world has been told it can go no further in its march to world domination. The performance of the United States Army in Vietnam and throughout the Pacific has made it abundantly clear to the enemy and the world that it is holding the line for freedom and will not be driven from the battlefield. <laughs>